Hey, what's up, everybody? And thank you for listening to Operation Agency Freedom, where we are bringing you top secret advice from the world's most badass digital agency owners. These amazing men and women are sharing their stories of how they have built six, seven, and eight figure digital agencies and how you can too. My name is Chris Martinez, CEO of Dude, where we help digital agencies by giving them the people and the processes so that they can take on more projects and scale profitably. Today, I am joined by my friend, Rob Warner, founder of Invisible PPC, coming live to us from the UK. Thank you so much, Rob, and for making time in your busy schedule and for being on with us today. Ah, Chris, it's my absolute pleasure. I'm glad to be here, sir. I mean, this is one that's just like a, lo a long time coming, and I don't know why I didn't ask you sooner. Um, I have so much respect for your company, and we're very, very excited to learn more about what you're doing at Invisible. That's, I just thought it was because you hated me and you didn't like anything we did, so. <laughs> yeah, that's totally it. No, it's, my, it's me being a stupid American. I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> So before we get into Invisible PPC, of course, you know, we always start off with our roundtable discussion. And, um, you know, so you said outside of the business, my main thing is fitness. So I want to hear, you know, because likewise, fitness is a huge part of my life. It's always been a huge part of my life. Um, and it's one of the things that a lot of agency people struggle with and that they find like they don't have time for. Um, but to me, it's like, you know, I can't run the business if I'm not working out. So I would love to hear how fitness influences your business and how you also, you know, run your life. So fitness for me, it's, it's been a big part of my life forever in various different shapes and forms. I and mean, what I do, how I do it, when I do it, it's changed over the years. Mm -hmm. It went from long distance running to marathons to ultra marathons wow. to for my 40. To my 40th birthday, my gift to myself was I ran seven marathons in a week um, down the down the UK's longest river. That was my 40th birthday present. So, wow. Uh, latterly, um, now I'm kind of an old man, and in, in my later 40s, um, my ankle doesn't like particularly doing the really long stuff. And, and about yeah. four years ago, I got massively into CrossFit. Okay, and I've been into CrossFit ever since. So, I probably train there five days a week um, but it's recently evolved actually over lockdown when we had we had like a three-month lockdown in the uk due to covid right um, when all the gyms were closed so we kitted out our garage gym and we've basically got a crossfit gym at home now nice. um, and so i've taken the opportunity to pivot again so what i've done this most recently and there's a kind of direct link to how i manage my training with how i manage my business and that um I'm relatively time poor, like many busy agency owners. I've got you know, a longer task list than I have a time list. So <laughs> um, if I don't commit to training on a morning, first thing usually, I don't get to train um, because by lunchtime, I end up talking to lots of Americans and my day gets very busy. So yes. Evenings are busy for me. So it has to be a morning thing. Um, so what I wanted to do was I went out and I took, uh, for the first time ever, um, a full fitness assessment. So this was things like resting metabolic rate, uh -huh. um, uh, VO2 max rate, so you know, things uh -huh. where they put a mask on you and you measure uh -huh. your breathing and your ability to convert yep. oxygen and things. Horrible experience. I mean, it's, it's not a fun thing to do. But here's the thing. Here's why I did it. Um, I know I have roughly a, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes a day I can commit. Uh -huh. and, and I dread the idea of being the kind of middle-aged fat guy I, i'm not gonna do that uh, because i care about my family and myself too much to allow that to happen so for me that said to me okay go through the benchmarking try not to get emotionally attached to the results that they give you when they give you <laughs> your scores and your feedback um because that's the hard thing is treat it as data treat it as information yeah that's your score that has now given me all the weak areas in my fitness. So there are certain points in my fitness profile where I have weaknesses, many of them. Um, um, and so um, we then had the, I guess, the fitness test guy sent his results over to my guy who does all my, co my programming for me. He sets my daily workout routines for me uh -huh. and also to, he, to the nutrition guy. So I now have, you know, as a result of that benchmark, a fitness plan that's specifically tailored to the things that I'm weakest at, 
but structured in a way that I enjoy training. So CrossFit style training, it's fun, it's different, it's varied, and I love doing it. Um, but with a nutrition plan to match so that I've got the maximum output from the minimum amount of time input. And for me, that's really important. It means I'm making a really good use of that time. Yeah. Um, I'm strongly find where my brain goes, where my, my body will follow. If the brain's not engaged, the body ain't interested. If I know I'm doing this particular routine or workout for a reason, I'm in. Yes. So that's been a good move. Um, and it feels you can, you can make the connection. You can join the dots now. That's awesome, man. So I can definitely relate to that too. Um, like I'm a few years younger than you. I just turned 40, but I've also had massive, <laughs> I've ha also had some pretty serious injuries. I've torn both of my Achilles tendons. I, last year I tore my meniscus. I'm constantly injured from doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and then just, you know, training or overtraining. My question to you is how have you coped with the fact that we are getting older and we do need to, to adjust the standard of fitness uh, just based on the fact that our bodies just aren't working the same way that they were when we were in our 20s? Yeah, so it's, it's a weird thing. So what I didn't say was when I went for the fitness test, I took my daughter's boyfriend with me, who's uh -huh. 19 years old, and also oh, a CrossFit coach, incredibly yeah. fit. Uh, yeah. I took one of my colleagues with me who is 15 years younger than me and also very fit. So I was kind of like the after picture. I was the, this is what you could look like. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think what you have to do for me, it's about, I'm not there to compete against anybody. I'm not there to beat a score. It's nice when I do. Yeah. But for me, it's about what am I getting out of this for me? And that's why, for example, I could have surgery and have my ankle cleaned out and be able to do long distance runs again. Do I really want to do that when I can do an hour of CrossFit and get fitter and stronger? Yeah. No. So I'm kind of balancing and focusing on what gives me the best health, strength, fitness outcomes. Um, focus on those. And yeah, I occasionally will do a CrossFit competition, mm -hmm. but it's really a measure of progress. It's, I'm not there to win. I'm never going to win. I'm never going to be the best guy in the room. Yeah. Um, but I get to, you know, give myself a goal. I, I train much better with a goal. Uh, without a goal, I just drift. And I think that that's also a giant metaphor for business too, because no matter how big your business is, if you have an agency that's doing 2000 bucks a month, or you have an agency that's doing 2 million bucks a month, in many ways, your only competition is yourself and what you want and your own goals. Yeah, completely, completely. So, I, I, can't, I don't have anybody else's body or age. So I've only got <laughs> the only one I can deal with is my own. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, awesome, man. I, thanks so much for sharing that. Definitely inspirational. Um, and for any of you guys who are out there needing some fitness advice, definitely reach out to me or Rob will probably <laughs> answer some questions for you too. Um, I just say go get a CrossFit gym and let them do bad things to you. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. All right. So let's get into Invisible PPC because you and I met yeah. through traffic and conversion, uh, I think it was mm. two or three years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, like you guys are legendary. Um, and the unique thing that we talked about prior to the show was you're based in the UK. You have a ton of clients in the States. Um, the UK is not necessarily seen, at least from my perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the UK is not necessarily seen as a hub for marketing innovation, a digital marketing innovation. So that's another thing that makes you guys very, very unique. So tell us your story of how you guys got started. Uh, my, my story of how I got started is really stupid. Um, so <laughs> I had a software company about 2011, 2012, uh -huh. um, that was uh, failing spectacularly. And we, what do you think, what do you think it was failing? What do you think it was failing? Uh, we, so we had all our business was designed around government and government okay. business in uh -huh. the UK at the time. And if you recall 29, 2010, there was the big crash. Yep. We had a new government came in and they froze all spending on the things that we were selling. Um, I had one of my worst weeks of my life when I went on vacation with a, what at the time was about a $300,000 order book. Um, and by the time I came back on the Friday, when I went on the Monday, I got back on the Friday, every single order was canceled. And nice. they effectively put a spending freeze on that lasted over a year. So not surprisingly, that was quite a tough time. Yeah, um, so we pivoted the product a little and made a commercial version available. Um, and hey, I'm a numbers guy, I'm a finance guy. So for me, selling scared the hell out of me. So 
Um, I didn't want to go out and sell stuff. So we ran some Google ads and it worked. And from there, somebody else asked us to run their Google ads and somebody else and somebody else. And I was absolutely flat broke. The business had taken every penny I had, many that I didn't. Uh Um, And it was massively in debt. And, you know, if there were payment to dance on the table, I'd have said yes at that point in life, you know. And, you know, running some Google ads was a much better option for everybody. So that's what we did. We ran some Google ads and I got lucky. Uh, my third client um, approached me from an agency and said, look, um, we're an agency. We do web design and SEO. We don't do PPC. We've got a ton of clients. They were a seven figure agency. How about we work together? You do all the nerdy technical Google ad stuff and I'll do all the sales and we'll split the money. And I'm like, that's the business model for me. That's where I want to go. That's what yeah. I want to do. And from there, it kind of grew. And it grew through Facebook groups predominantly. Uh-huh. And I, I, most of our early growth was based on mark, local marketing Facebook groups where I was just helpful. When anybody had a Google Ads query, I was helpful. And I used to wake up every morning to a ton of private messages on Facebook saying, hey, I saw you answered this question on Google. It seems you know a bit of stuff. Could you do you white label for agencies? And I'm like, of course I do. And it kind of grew and it grew. So then I came over to the US to an event and it just exploded. And that was by that time, we were into sort of 2013. In fact, uh-huh. October 2013 was the first time I came to the US in this business for local marketing summit. And it changed everything for us. Okay. So 2010, 2011, flat broke, 2013, go to the event, it explodes and it takes off. Is that kind of like the timeline? Yeah, yeah. yeah we had kind of a year of growing already. So in the year prior, yeah. that was that was where all this kind of Facebook stuff was happening. Yeah. It was growing through there. And it was as a result of that, when this event happened, it was kind of said to my wife, look, we're just about scraped enough money together. I said, look, all of my customers mainly are in the US because that's who's in these Facebook groups. Exactly. Didn't plan that to happen. It just happened. I was kind of doing calls with Australia, New Zealand at six in the morning or five in the morning, calls with California at 11 o'clock at night. And I was getting a bit burnt out. Um, but I said, they could be using anybody in the world and using this guy from the UK. I'm going to have to go, I'm going to go to this event. I know a bunch of them are going to be there and I can go and see them face to face and try and build some more relationships and never know, I might come back with another customer or two. Well, I still have relationships from that event for customers who are still customers in 2020, who I met at that event in 2013. Oh, that's amazing. So uh, it was staggeringly good for us. And we've continued that since. So having established the US base, it kind of became self-fulfilling and that one would refer another, would refer another, refers another, and it kind of grew. And so before I knew it, if you fast forward over the years since, you know, we're a team of about 30 people now, but Mm -hmm. most of them are in in the US and most of our clients are in the US. That's amazing. So let's going back to that event, because I, I want to ask you about this because I have the same story, basically. Um, what were you guys doing in revenue at the time when you decided to go to that event? Which I, What was the name of it again? It was Local Marketing Summit. It was in Denver, Colorado, October okay. 2013. Okay. So uh, what, approximately what were you guys doing in monthly recurring revenue and, uh, and how much was the event all in to get there to, to Denver? Uh, we were probably doing a about 10 grand, 10, 15 grand at the time. Mm-hmm. It was small. It was and, nothing, it was nothing big. Um, yeah. but it was in bear in mind at that point there was me, uh, one part-time project manager and a freelancer. That's and, that was our team. So your cost to go to that event was easily ten thousand bucks, right? Uh, I managed to do it for about half that. Okay, so about five thousand dollars. So about half yeah. of your money. I didn't, I didn't fly in the comfy seats for that one. Yeah, <laughs> I was definitely absolutely. in the cheap seats. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the transfer bus, not a limo. You know, this was this was a budget trip. Yeah, um, that's great. And then what well, is your could've ROI? Could've what was your ROI on that that five thousand dollar investment? Uh, you couldn't even calculate. Let's put it this way: one client alone, who we've had since twenty thirteen, pays us ten thousand a month. That's amazing. And, and they've been a client since twenty thirteen. That's so, so cool. And they're not the only one. So, you, you know, hey, it's just off the charts. There's and, but, so many. People, Sorry, go ahead. So you've got to put yourself in these positions, though. It's my strong belief. You've got to. Be, I could have easily said, these guys are happy talking to me on the phone or on Skype or whatever. I'll keep doing that. And I made the decision that actually, if I want to strengthen and build these relationships, um, you've got to put yourself in, in a room where, where you can do that 
and sometimes that means getting uncomfortable going to it. I've never been to a marketing event before in my life. Right. Um, but it was good. But I built a relationship with the event organizer before I went. I ran an educational webinar for him before I went out there. So they knew me. Um, I was able to do stuff at the event. I got called out by name on it on the very first morning in the first keynote. Uh-huh. So I mean, there, were, there were 400 people in that room. I didn't know there were going to be 400 people when I turned up there. Um, so I just strongly believe you just got to put yourself in places where good things can happen. Absolutely. There's so many lessons that you just unveiled. Um, so first of all, the Facebook group, right? And this is like a thing that I see happening so many times and it's unbelievably frustrating is that, you know, like you do the friend request and automatically that person's like, hey, what do you do? I do this. Da, 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 da. It's like, dude, piss off. Like, I, I don't want to be spammed by you. Go to the group. Yep. Like you went to the group and you just provided value. Just answer questions. Like just try and help people. Like it's not that hard. All, all I did was answer questions. Yep. And if I saw something, because obviously Google changed stuff all the time. Yeah. If something changed, I was aware of a change that what generally wasn't known about. I'd mention it in the group. And that was it. I never, never pitched once there. Right. And here's the cool thing that happened at the end of all of that. Um, it got to the point about six to nine months in that if somebody asked a Google question or needed a, a service provider, I'd wake up to a bunch of messages on the tags and comments on the thread on the morning going, uh, use Rob's team, go to Rob, go to Rob, go to Rob, go to Rob. And there'd be just a string of my customers recommending other people to me. And so I was getting sales inquiries when I wasn't even there doing anything, which at the time was mind blowing for me. I'd never had that before. And it was just yeah. the nicest feelings as a sales shy person, having people voluntarily walking towards you is a great thing. But isn't that kind of like the core of marketing anyways? It's like, you're, you're basically putting yourself, there, there's a crowd of people walking down the street and you're putting yourself in front of those people. And if they have a question or they have a need, then they turn to you because you have the answer. That's really what marketing is, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So this, and then the second, the second big lesson there is going to that event, right? You know, not doing a ton of revenue, um, knowing that your folks are going to be there, and then just having that face-to-face connection. Because we did the same thing, you know. Like when I launched Dude in 2017, um, I did go to some other events too. We had, we were doing about 10 grand a month, and then traffic and conversion in San Diego happened yeah, yeah. for. For us, it was about a $10,000 investment. So about one month's worth of uh, monthly recurring revenue. Um, but our return on investment off that one event was insane. I mean, we ended up doing, we finished 20, uh, 2018 around 400K in monthly recurring revenue. But I can't remember what our what our actual monthly like run rate was at the time. I think it was around like 50 or 60 grand. Um, and we went from five employees to 29 employees and all of that, I wouldn't say all of it, but a lot of that was based on what we did at traffic and conversion. You, uh, I just strongly believe you've got to put your place in, put yourself in places where things can be enabled to happen. Absolutely. And almost do it from a point of view. Of, it's one of my, my lesson for networking or masterminding or anything. Uh, cause I used to, again, they're not my kind of comfort zone is go there with the expectation of having one interesting conversation. Yes. That's, that's my goal. And the rest of it tends to take care of itself. Yeah. And it depressurizes it for you. And you don't feel that every conversation you're looking for that sales opportunity and you're looking and you're looking because that just gets uncomfortable for everybody. Right. Um, right. People can smell that. They can sense that. Yeah. It's almost like a, a take an interest. Exactly. Just, you know, go make friends, go meet people, have a genuine conversation, be unique. Exactly. So, you know, we, we kind of just skipped over uh, Invisible PPC and what you guys are doing. So what are the main things that you're helping people out with today? So it's interesting. Um, I had this conversation just 20 minutes before we spoke. If you'd have asked me this this time last year, the answer would have been white label Google ads. Um, with, and when I say white label Google ads, we do everything for that. We do pre-sales support. We do the mm-hmm. campaign builds, landing pages, reporting, track call, tracking. The whole thing is what I would have said we do. But basically, Google ads, white labeled. And we spend about two and a half million a month with Google. So, you know, we run a lot of this stuff. Um, and some Facebook and a little bit of Bing. That would have been it. If I fast forward to today, um, we have agency training where obviously most agencies usually want to know how to sell more. We train agencies how to do that. Uh Um, We've 
just getting ready to announce and maybe by the time this comes out it'll probably be announced that we've actually just taken over a reporting dashboard company so we now have our own in-house reporting dashboard um, that we're making available as a SaaS and we've just built a, an internal Google Ads SaaS that is I believe going to turn the industry upside down in a really really good way so um it's an exciting time ahead. We've taken the view firmly that we are looking to deliver software-enabled services where we can build things that give our partners a, an unassailable advantage in their marketplace. And that's what we want to do, is give them the thing that nobody else can give them that makes their service offering better. Because if you're not careful, agencies end up just all sounding alike. Yeah. And I don't like that. I believe agencies can do a really, really good job and if we give them the ammunition to say, here's why we're different and here's why you should care because this is really good for you, um, then that's my goal. And I want to make sure, reach as many agencies and business owners as we can. Now, did you, it, did you expand into those different areas? I call that owning the board. So you, you start off in one part and then you basically look at all the other things that you need to help your clients out with. And then eventually you own this like game board. Did you... Did, yeah. How did you eventually come to that realization that you needed to expand and start offering things uh, that are complementary, but not necessarily directly related to what you guys do? So for me, it came down to um, one thing really, and that one and it applies across everything that we've built this year. We've built things that solve problems that the market should have solved in my opinion a long time ago and hasn't. Um, so we're not built, we've never set out to build something that's up, some, you know, our version of something that everybody else has already got. There's no point mm -hmm. in doing that. Right. You know? So the tools we've built this year or what we've acquired this year, we've acquired very specifically because the market doesn't do a good job, good enough job, in my opinion, with the tools that it's providing. Our services are compromised, our client results are compromised, our client relationships. And I don't like that. So we kind of took the view of we would not accept the kind of marketing bullshit and unacceptable answers that are out there if it, if the problem wasn't properly solved we would put the time and the money into solving it ourselves okay can you back up for a second and explain that a little bit further if the problem isn't solved you're going to figure out how to say what how, can you say that yeah. again? so, so let, let me give you an example of it yeah um i'll give you an example of one of the tools that we've built um so we've built ourselves a landing page builder, mm -hmm. which which sounds insane. There are a dozen or twenty or more. I uh, could go they, to the, there's like a hundred landing page builders out there. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you do that? So here's the thing. If you think about Google Ads and what we sell, we sell effectively performance for our clients. We're selling leads, inquiries, converts. It's, it's wrapped in Google Ads, but fundamentally, we need to make the phone ring or forms come into their website, mm -hmm. and. One of the biggest drivers to that is the landing page. You know, yes, absolutely. I can change a landing page and double or treble conversions without touching the ad, ad campaign just because the landing page is better. But here's the problem. Um, most ad accounts have small traffic. We're dealing with local businesses. We're dealing with dentists, plumbers, chiros, doctors. You get the idea. Lawyers. Um, they're getting hundreds of clicks a month, not tens of thousands of clicks a month. So split testing landing pages takes forever. Yeah, It's really time consuming. You know, you could be six months in before you get a meaningful split test, which is ridiculous. Right. Um, right. You can't sell that with any kind of value because by the time you, when I'm looking at a campaign we're doing at the moment, which gets 20 clicks a week. <laughs> now, how can I do that? So it's okay. If we still know that this is one of the biggest levers we can pull for landing pages, how do we do it? So we came up with a process where we build a page design. And it's a proven design. So we start with a proven design that we built in one of the other builders. And we turn it into a template that we can automatically deploy to multiple pages with their own, keep their own contact intact. That means I can then aggregate my data up to the template design level, not the page level. So if I've got that in 10 pages now, that design, I've got 10 times the traffic volume for my testing. Awesome. And I can do that and split test it at the push of a button. So doesn't, but so, doesn't copy have some sort of impact on that? Headlines matter, you know, like the offer of matters. Oh, completely. 
Completely. And we can split test content as well. But if I've got 10, if I've got 10 dentists, all with the same service, with similar offers on them, and I can cha change their performance by changing a design, then I can analyze that at a much higher level than I can do that and much faster. So my clients get faster wins, get better testing programs. I mean, it's built into it, for example. We built in there heat mapping, session mapping, recording. Mm -hmm. So we get to know how these pages work and we can accelerate everything we do and the results we deliver. And we can do it at a push of a button. There's no landing page builder on the market that solves that problem for me. Right. So we built one. Does That's that make awesome. Sense? That, that explain why we did it. It explains, I mean, I understand it 100%. Um, and hopefully our agencies that are listening to this understand that as well. But if you don't understand, that's another reason why they need to reach out to you and use your landing page builder. <laughs> um, my question, because, you know, we're look, like I mentioned to you, we're looking to build our, our first software, um, a quoting software. And um, what was the minimum viable product for this, this landing page builder? Um. Or is this the minimum viable product, the one that you're rolling we, we out? Built, I, would say, I would say we've built version 1.1. So for us, minimum viable product, it, it, it's, I like to look at the goal we're trying to achieve, not necessarily specific features and things. It's, does it allow us to achieve our goal? And our mm -hmm. goal that we wanted for this, the things that we set out was pages must be lightning fast. So anything that scores less than a 90 on the Google page speed score, not acceptable, has to be fast. Mm -hmm. uh, which most landing page builders aren't, but that was a given. We have to be able to deploy a template change in you know half a dozen clicks. And we have to be able to analyze performance um, at, at an upgraded level and reuse content. That was what we designed as our kind of high level goals for this. Um, to get to that, it took us probably three months. Um, That's fast. And what we've done, yeah, but what we've done is we're, we're quite smart about it. So we said, okay, what technology already exists that we can repackage and repurpose? So for example, our page builder is based on a framework called grapes.js, which is a page builder framework. So okay. we've taken that. We wanted heat maps and session recording. Well, we found an open source stats, pack, stats package that has all the data collection tools. Mm -hmm. The interface was used, awful. So we kind of took the data collection process, threw away the interface and pulled it into ours. You know, so each time we're kind of looking at, at some point, we'll, we'll replace Jape, great, possibly, yep. or put our own, but it doesn't matter. We're able to get this thing to market by leveraging two of the three big jobs we've kind of done for us. And that's what we look for where we can. It isn't always possible. Um, the other thing we look for is minimum viable revenue. Uh, which we're not there with this yet because we're using it internally. But yeah. we look for SaaS platforms that have minimum viable revenue because we can kind of manage them internally till they get to our case, we use 10,000 a month as our minimum viable revenue. When they're at 10,000, we'll move them into their own environment, put a CEO in, give them a profit and loss account, make them accountable mm -hmm. for performance mm -hmm. and back them, but back them as a separate entity to our core business so that they can grow and they don't get lost in the mix. So when you look at the minimum viable revenue, what are like the gross and net uh, gross gross profit margin and net income that you're looking for from those? I, I don't care about net. Okay. Uh, at that point, uh, to get to get to 10k, I'm really looking at um, can we do it using can we get to 10k using our existing resources? And that mm -hmm. will usually mean software developer, mm -hmm. an in-house project manager who we usually pull part time off something else they're working on and say you're interested in this, go and play with this. Yep. Um, and and essentially, my myself and my business partner Joe's leadership and project management, at sort of on a weekly basis. We need to be able to get to 10k at that recurring revenue at that point. And I don't care if those, as long as those costs are covered, I kind of don't care. Yeah. Because I know at that point I can then scale and grow it and put a CEO in, or right. probably a lower right. cost CEO, who then they can run it and scale it and grow it. So at that point, it's about proof of market, proof of process, uh -huh. um, not about profit. Great. I absolutely love this. Um, guess what, Rob? We're, we're out of time, though. And I know it's late for you. I so I know. So we're, we're definitely going to have to have you on again uh, when you guys have version 1.2 ready to go to the landing page. Well, I, I've, I've not even told you the best tool that we've built yet because we've built something that will change the whole Google Ads industry. And 
when we have more time to talk about it, I'll tell you about it in more. Oh, awesome. I can't wait for that. Seven-year vision it's been to get to this point. Wow, that's amazing. Hey, thanks so much for being on the show. Um, So, Rob, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, Just hit us up at invisiblepcc.com. There's a bunch of free stuff on there as well if you go to our resources page. So I would strongly recommend anybody who goes there, go to the resources page. If you've got any vague interest in Google ads at all, um, or any other things I've just talked about, like reporting dashboards or landing page builders, um, if you sign up for our Smart Pages program there, which is free, um, then you'll get everything you need and we'll be able to communicate with you. Awesome. And who would be the perfect person to reach out to you? So for us, the perfect people for us that we work with most are small agencies who are- What do you mean by small? Are, define, define that a little so, bit better so, for me. So small for me, it's typically one to five people. Okay. Um, who usually have a handful of clients, um, either have Google Ads clients already or are looking to acquire them and don't want to do it in-house or are doing it in-house and are struggling and would prefer just to get rid of it. That's our kind of core person that we support. Perfect. Awesome, man. I got some referrals for you. (laughs) Um, And for those of you that are listening, if nothing else, go to Rob's site, invisiblepcc.com just for the retargeting so that you can see some of their retargeting ads that they're running right now. One of the best lead magnets that I've ever seen, the landing page template. Um, I think I signed up for it. I can't remember. Um, (laughs) It is awesome. So uh, definitely check that out. But thank you so much, Rob, for being on the show, man. This is an absolute, so many pearls of wisdom that you dropped for us. I really appreciate it. And we will definitely have you back on. Um, Anytime, sir. So, All right. And to all of you listeners out there, thank you guys for tuning in today and make sure that you return next Thursday and every Thursday for the next episode of Operation Agency Freedom. Bye, guys.